This episode of Unified is brought to you in part by Ebbets Field Flannels, the leader in vintage authentic sports apparel since 1988. To put that in some perspective, the first pro sports throwback game didn't even happen until 1990, but our friends at Ebbets Field Flannels were already setting the pace for authentic retro sportswear. And when we say our friends, we really mean it. Chris and I have worked with Jerry Cohen, Andy Hyman, and the other great people at Ebbets Field Flannels for years. Ebbets even makes my official uni watch baseball caps. They're great people, and of course, they make and sell sensational products, including authentic vintage jerseys, caps, t-shirts, jackets, and more. Check them out at ebbets.com and get 10% off any merchandise except NFL items by using the checkout code UNIFIED. Again, that's ebbets.com and get 10% off anything except NFL items with the checkout code UNIFIED. Welcome to the Unified Show. I'm Chris Creamer. Along with me, of course, is Paul Lucas of UniWatch.com. It's the Ocho, episode number eight. <laughs> we are all set to uh, tackle today's topic. But first, good news. My good friend Paul fixed his microphone this week. Good job, Paul. We yeah. hope so anyway. Yeah, we let's, hope, uh, let's so. hope I'm sounding better this week than in the you, past two weeks. You sound better on the Zoom call, so hopefully that translates over uh, <laughs> to the actual Thanks, thanks uh, for everybody for having patience with us. We're still figuring out some of the details of this podcasting stuff. We're still very new at this. It's okay. Mm. We, we appreciate that. And uh, completely, you know, for our, our uh, visual uh, watchers here, we did not plan the red... You know, we're both, red. Just, like, just like we both wore green last week for St. Patty's Day. Uh, this week we're both wearing red. I wore red because uh, I'm wearing a San Francisco 49ers jersey in honor of uh, Paul's favorite uh, NFL team. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wearing I'm wearing the closest thing I own to a 49ers jersey, which is a red t-shirt with white stripes. But uh, it's it's sort of a it's a simulation of a 49ers jersey. <laughs> That's, it's it's sort of the old school way of wearing a 49ers jersey. Yeah. You just need the the big uh, vinyl numbers on the front with no name on the back. <laughs> this is actually this is an old navy shirt I've had for over. I don't know, like 11, 12 years. And uh, it's, it's, but it's classic. It's like, it, it looks uniform -y, you it, know? It's, uh, it's evergreen. Well, it's ever red. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite NFL team is being represented via the big Carolina Panthers logo behind me on the wall. And Chris, uh, I have known you all these years and I did not know that the Carolina Panthers were your favorite team. Is that really true? That's true. Uh, and it started, I was a big Buffalo Bills fan in the 90s, and then they decided to uh, get rid of Doug Flutie, and that was enough for me as, uh -huh. a, uh, as a CFL Argos fan. And uh, the Carolina Panthers sent me a nice message on my birthday on Twitter, and I said, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. You're, you're easy. <laughs> I, I was a free agent fan, so that's all it took. And we're talking a lot about the NFL this week because that's our main topic. We are going to address the NFL's one helmet rule and how that might be changing heading into the 2021 NFL season. We're going to talk about how teams are only permitted to wear just one helmet, uh, why the rule even exists, some of the uh, pretty cool uniforms that we have lost because of this rule, and uh, what, might, what might happen if teams are allowed to wear multiple helmets once again in the upcoming year. Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I've had actually a, a very eventful week. Uh, Thursday, last Thursday, I got to see my mom for the first time in over a year. She's That's in assisted nice. living and uh, they were in lockdown. And in fact, they're back in lockdown now because somebody there tested positive. But during a brief window when they were allowing, allowing visits again, I was able to see her and she's in her 90s. And so that was great. Then two days after that, my girlfriend got her first vaccination shot. Uh, that was Saturday. And then the day after that on Sunday was my birthday. So uh, I had a lot of good things going down since our last episode. How did I, I missed your birthday. I'm so you sorry. Miss, but you know, I remember last year you sent me like a little video of yourself <laughs> reading my book <laughs> saying like, oh, hello there. As if somebody had just come across you like in the middle of reading a book that happened to be my book, which was very, so I, I think you got like two years worth of birthday credit for that one. I, I apologize. I usually uh, note your birthday and I'll, you know what? I'm going to blame the pandemic. Can I do that? You can definitely it's, blame the pandemic. Had nothing to do with it, but I'm going to, well, anyways, happy birthday, Paul. 
you look fantastic for 75 and uh, <laughs> you, you actually you now you're close because you got the numerals reversed it's it's 57 Seven, of course Heinz the, the, yeah oh you know I never thought it's the Heinz birth, oh, it's the Heinz birth. Yeah, so it's good that I'm wearing a red ketchup uh, colored uh, t-shirt once, once again or you could wear a Steelers jersey if you want but I think as a 49ers <laughs> uh, fan how was your week since we uh, last saw each other Every week's eventful in my life, uh, so I try to pick out just one moment that stuck out. And uh, yesterday, my wife and I decided to go for a hike in the nearby forest. Uh, you know, the kids are at school. We have more time together alone. Let's go take a hike, uh, literally. And uh, we met one of our friends there, and it was nice uh, until we got lost. <laughs> And we were, uh, we had no idea where to go. There's nobody else around. All the trails were covered in ice and snow because it just hadn't melted yet. And there was no uh, trail markers or anything. So we just walked around in circles for a while. The uh, GPS on our phones weren't doing too much. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I, you seem to have found your way back, so. Well, no, this is a, a green screen behind me. I'm still in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, by the end, I just, well, I know we parked to the west, so let's follow the sun. <laughs> and that's how we got back to our car. A little embarrassing, but uh, the kids enjoyed the story when we picked them up from work. <laughs> uh, as, as friends of Frozen 2 and any of the uh, moms and dads out there listening, we were literally lost in the woods. And I'm not going to sing the song. And I'm, Paul, you know the song, of course. I do. You do. Okay. <laughs> Probably not as well as you do. No, no, absolutely not. I, I hear it probably nonstop on repeat in this place. <laughs> so what happened this last week in uh, Uniform News? Uh, There's a bit of Uniform News this past week. Uh, one interesting thing that happened was uh, the owner of the Cleveland Indians, Paul Dolan, said that, uh, well, we know, uh, we have known that this is presumably the last season that the Indians are going to be still called the Indians. Uh, and they're going to have some sort of new identity. And he, uh, Paul Dolan, said this past week that it might not be ready, this new identity, for next season. Uh, and the, he had never really promised that it would be. Uh, he never committed to a specific timetable. But the assumption was that it was going to be ready in time for 2022. And now he's saying, well, we're not really sure about that because of trademark issues and licensing issues and things like that. He said they would know by this summer whether it will be ready, the new identity, whatever it turns out to be, will be ready for 2022. And what he didn't really clear up is that if it's not ready, if they don't have a new name ready for 2022, would they remain the Indians for one more season? Or would they pull a sort of Washington football team move and become the Cleveland baseball team, a sort of placeholder name for, for one season for 2022, and then roll out the new identity, whatever it turns out to be, for 2023. So there's a, a lot of variables there. And we don't know what that new identity is going to be. The names that are most often being tossed around by fans seem to be the Spiders, which is you know an old Cleveland baseball team name, uh, or the Municipals for Municipal Stadium. Uh, uh, and then you can call them the Munis, and we can talk about the Munis Unis and, and Muni Watch and all sorts. Like if, if they're called the Municipals, you know, Uniform people have can have a lot of fun with that. So I'm kind of rooting for that one. Uh, but we don't know what it's going to be yet or how that's all going to play out. But it's sort of interesting that uh, it's still up in the air. Now, the article I read, I, I thought he said, if they don't have a new name picked by the summer, they're going to be the Indians next year, right? Like, Did he commit? I, I wasn't so sure he committed to that. I'll, but I'll we'll, to we'll see how that plays out. Uh, and, you know, it's it, another thing that surfaced this past week was that they had been dabbling with a home, a new home alternate jersey that just had Cleveland across the chest rather than Indians. And that, that turned, up, turned up in a video game that, that apparently they had been sort of experimenting with that or dipping their toe in that water or whatever. And uh, the, the Cleveland lettering was just like the lettering on their road jersey, their gray road jersey, only it was on a, a white jersey. And so they were apparently dabbling with the idea of just not using Indians at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they decided, well, no, we are going to stick with the team name for at least this one more season. But one last uh, while, while, right? that, while that design was scrubbed, I guess, from retail and from style guides and things like that, it was not scrubbed from this one video game. And so that began circulating. And so that's an interesting sort of phantom design. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you uh, uh, spoke to the team about this, right? Is that uh, I did. I spoke with an Indian okay. spokesman, uh, a team rep, not Paul Dolan, not the owner, but uh, I did speak with a team rep. 
And he said, yeah, that we were considering going with that. And then once we decided to retain the current team, team name for another season, mm -hmm. uh, we decided not to go ahead with it, but uh, they don't control what's in the video game. I right. I, I was wondering if that was something the video game people did on their own, perhaps as, you know, maybe we don't want to use the Indian's name in the game. So let's just make our own uniform. Well, I don't think it was the only option. I think it was just an option right. you know, that, that fans with that, of that video game uh, could still use. Uh, the basic home jersey that does say things. So what do you think about them going another year with it? I um, Would you, okay, so let me ask you this. Would you rather they continue as the Indians in 23, or sorry, in 22, mm -hmm. uh, or would you like a one season only generic name? Frankly, I, I mean, I've wanted them to get rid of the name for years. So I, I would rather them be the Cleveland baseball team or basically almost anything else as soon as possible. So okay. yeah, I don't, I don't want to see the team name retained. I mean, it, you know, there's all sorts of issues here, like trademark squatters, yeah. you know, people who, who buy up everything from Twitter handles to domain names, to trademark rights, to, to various potential names so that they can essentially uh, put the squeeze on the team and try to get a little cash out of them and say, oh, you want this domain name or you want the trademark rights to this way, you got to pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's sort of a form of speculating or prospecting. Uh, which we see in other, there, yeah. there are other businesses where that goes on, but we don't see it that often in sports because team names don't change that often. That's right. Yeah. We saw it a lot with Washington too. And I, I hear they're still dealing with that. I know they probably can't use this name, but I love Buckeyes as, as a name. Oh, Buckeye, yeah. Buckeyes yeah. would be great. But with Ohio State. So. I think Ohio State might have something to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they'd have to start putting stickers all over their batting helmets. and <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> they could be great. They could be the first uh, baseball team to do that. Yeah. Uh, and if they did go uh, municipals and shortened to munis, it's kind of like the Mets with Metropolitans. Right? Absolutely. So yeah. There's a little precedent there. Yeah. That's right. Uh, speaking of baseball and, and sticking with baseball uh, during this, actually, all of our topics this week are baseball. Isn't that funny? That's Until like, we get to our main topic. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Our mini topics are all baseball. Uh, a San Diego Padres Under Armour prototype jersey uh, found its way to the internet yesterday. Uh, this was the first time, as far as I know, anybody has seen a photograph of this actual jersey. And and for people who who don't know or don't remember, uh, Nike, of course, took over Major League Baseball's uniform contract from Majestic last year. But the the company that was originally supposed to replace Majestic was Under Armour, and Under Armour had inked a deal with Major League Baseball. Their logo was going to appear going to appear on the chest, just like Nike's now does, and that was a big change because up until then, Majestic and Russell and other uniform manufacturers had only had their logo on the sleeve. Uh, and Under Armour inked this deal. It was announced uh, in December of 2016. It was supposed to kick in in 2020. Then they moved it up to 2019. Then they moved it back to 2020 again, and then Under Armour backed out. And it was really the the start of what has become a spiral. Uh, for Under Armour, you know, they've pulled out of so many of their college deals, they're, they're clearly in, in some kind of financial difficulty and they have cash flow issues and we're not going to get into all of that. But uh, somewhere in there, a lot of Under Armour prototype Major League Baseball jerseys were made and I had never seen any of them until, uh, until yesterday. We're recording this on Tuesday, so when we say yesterday, we mean, we mean Monday. Uh, and it was a, a San Diego Padres fan who went to the Padres annual garage sale, as they like to call it, where they, a lot of teams have these, where they sell off assorted gear and, and things like that. Um, but I was not aware of anyone ever having sold one of these Under Armour prototypes. And it was really interesting to see, particularly because of the fabric and particularly the fabric on the back of the jersey. Yeah, there was a diamond pattern on the back of the jersey that just took over the entire thing from shoulders down to tail. Yeah, it was a diamond mesh pattern. Yeah. So it was supposed to be sort of ventilation, but also uh, have a sort of graphic mm -hmm. aspect to it. And I actually heard from a source today, uh, a, let's just say a well-placed source who said, yes, this is indeed one of the prototypes because we, we were assuming it was, but there, there, was, there was no confirmation. Uh, but I, I got confirmation today from a source who said, yeah, that that was the plan to use this type of jersey and that the diamond pattern was meant to to be like a, a baseball diamond, that it was supposed to evoke baseball and to tell, as he put it, a visual ventilation story, 
which yeah. I have to say was just like <laughs> the most cringe inducing corporate speak ever. And I like I, I'm not usually a big Nike fan, but I, I'm feeling so thankful, at least for now. I, there's for now. plenty of time for, my, for Nike to still mess up Major League Baseball's uniforms. But at least for now, I feel like we had a narrow escape not to have had these Under Armour uniforms telling a visual ventilation story with a diamond shaped mesh pattern on the back. Some, somebody uh, record and save those words and play them back to Paul in a year or two. <laughs> yeah. He's so thankful <laughs> Nike took we'll over. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, oh, but how they, it certainly is interesting. And it's like a peek behind the curtain about uh, you yeah. know what was going on and what, what was in the works and what might have been uh, had Under Armour not backed out of the deal. And, uh, and supposedly this mesh pattern was going to be used not just for the Padres, where we're looking at this one Padres jersey, but for all the teams. Yeah, and considering the issues Majestic had with replicating pinstripes on their little mesh tail, uh, how would the New York Yankees and the New York Mets, how would they have looked with this mesh material? That's a really good question. Yeah. I hadn't even thought of that. Um, and we don't know how how number, how number typography, basically, numbers and letters would have looked because this jersey was blank on the back. It had the mesh fabric on the back, but it didn't have a number or a name. It didn't even have an MLB name. logo on the back. It was completely blank. Yeah, and there was no tagging on. That's why I was initially, honestly, I was a little suspicious or at least, you know, I was trying to maintain a little healthy skepticism because there was no tagging of any sort except a care label on yeah. this jersey. So an early, early prototype, perhaps. And certainly yeah, the, yes. certainly um, the- But, the, but again, I, I, I have a source who I trust who has confirmed that this was definitely the real deal. Uh, and that Padres design on there, I got to figure there's no way they were considering that with the double patch. No, because it had the, the SD on the chest, similar to their uh, 2016 jersey, but then it also had it on the on the sleeve, so it would have yeah. repeated. Uh, I but think, I, I think it, it, that may have just been a way for Under Armour to show what they could do. You know, here's how how our our twill fabric looks on the chest. Here's how it looks on the sleeve, and that type of thing. Absolutely. And it was in brown and gold, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Predated right, the sort of, uh, switch. Yeah. They, we they, all knew. They, we, they we knew the future coming. coming. It was the worst kept secret in all of uh, the uni world, <laughs> the universe. Let's go, let's go with that. And uh, finally, finishing up our baseball trilogy, uh, Justin Turner said he wants the LA Dodgers to wear a blue alternate jersey. He loves the one that the team's wearing during spring training. Well, it's interesting because Turner is a, an extremely popular player and both with fans and I think with his teammates. And we're seeing more of this now of players advocating for certain uniforms. Several Mets players have, have advocated for them to bring back the black uh, alternate jerseys uh, and the new owner, Steve Cohen, has said he may do that. So it's interesting to see players kind of cheerlead for certain uniforms, because especially non-pitchers, because pitchers get to choose what they wear often, right? For many teams, the starting pitcher gets to choose. Uh, but it's especially interesting for the Dodgers, who are such a famously straight-laced team. And they, they, you know, they did wear, actually, uh, blue alternate jerseys in 1999 and 2000. And it was just this, like, little kind of down. Chan Ho thing. Park! Chan Ho Park! Yeah. <laughs> the drop kick. Uh, but it, it's hard to imagine them doing something like that. But we know just the person to ask about that. And we're going to be asking him about that and, and other things soon. And that's Ross Yoshida, who's the art director and design director for the Dodgers. And uh, he's going to, we're going to sort of tease that here and, and let the cat out of the bag and say that next week we're going to have our first guest on Unified. And it's going to be Ross. And we're going to ask him about uh, the role he plays with the Dodgers. And it's sort of interesting to be the design director of a team that makes so few design changes. <laughs> But he's got a lot of opportunity to make logos with that team making it to the World Series every other year. So uh, yeah, right. right. Uh, and so we'll we'll ask him about that. You know, when a player wants uh, a new kind of jersey or a new uniform or wants certain changes made, how much pull does that have? You know, how much pull does the player have with the team? How much how much does the team take that into into account, if at all? Uh, and and that's that's one of I have a lot of questions for Ross yeah, actually. Okay. So I think it's gonna I think it's gonna be really fun. Uh, well, absolutely, I look forward to talking to Ross. He's a great guy too, and uh, you know someone I've interacted with on social media for years. I uh, never actually had a chance to talk to him uh, face to face, but uh, I'm looking forward. To yeah, I've never I've never met him in person, but uh, but I'm looking forward to that very much. I, and, I was supposed uh, to when we were in California last year, and I'm sure I'll get into this um, when we talk to him next week. Uh, but I was uh, plagued by LA traffic and just couldn't make it to him in time. And my kids wanted to go to Disneyland. So it was kind of uh, kids, <laughs> Ross, kids, Ross. Sorry, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> but finishing up this Dodgers blue alternate jersey thing, I, I, I think as traditional as the Dodgers are, 
uh, this one kind of feels acceptable, right? Because the Dodgers, you know, they always talk about Dodger blue and how, you know, and it, it's, it's a pretty straight laced alternate Jersey. Um, and if the Boston Red Sox can wear one, why can't the LA Dodgers? I don't want them to, but it yeah, wouldn't yeah. be like the worst thing ever if they did. And, and again, what Turner wants is not some like flashy, crazy blue Jersey. He okay. wants the, the spring training Jersey that they already wear for spring training to become uh, a full-fledged alternate game jersey that they can wear, you know, on fr for Friday night games or some, you know, whenever they choose to wear it, uh, and for it to be upgraded from spring training or BP status to game status. And if Justin Turner wants it and they end up doing it, I have a feeling you'll see that jersey worn uh, quite often. <laughs> if he gets his way, right? <laughs> quite possibly, because I mean, again, Turner is a, he's a popular player, and uh, I I think. Uh, they, if you're if you're in favor of that design, you couldn't have a better mouthpiece for it than Justin right. Turner. As long as that mouthpiece is wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Before, okay, right. Let's not right. get into that. Uh, hey, I have an ad read. Okay. Okay. Who, uh, who's who's our uh, who's our advertiser that you're going to regale us with? Well, our amazing advertiser is Oxford Pennant. Uh, this episode of Unified is brought to you in part by Oxford Pennant, designer and manufacturer of high quality pennants, flags, and banners. You know how so many sports pennants are stiff and unpleasant to the touch? Oxford Pennant's products are genuine wool felt, just like old school vintage pennants, so they're super soft. One touch and you can tell this is a quality product. Oxford even produces Paul's UniWatch pennants. Oxford Pennant has a full catalog of retail product promoting popular hometowns and clever sayings, but their real specialty is producing custom pieces for weddings, parties, and other special events. Whether their client is a couple celebrating an anniversary or the NFL's Buffalo Bills, all Oxford product is designed and manufactured at the company's downtown studio in Buffalo, New York. I've known the Oxford Pennant folks for years, and I can honestly say they're really special people. Check them out at OxfordPennant.com and get 20% off your order with the checkout code UNIFIED. That's OxfordPennant.com. Use the checkout code UNIFIED for 20% off. That's a good deal. That's a good discount. It is a good discount. And, and seriously, they are such nice pennants. They really are. They are. are. They're like, you want to touch them. They're, they're they like, feel like, the, they, yeah, like it says right in the, right here in the ad copy here, but it, it's, it's true, right? Like it feels like that felt stuff that you used to see, like you'd see hanging up in the behind, like at a gas station. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that or now, happened. now at vintage shops. Of, of various yes. Types. And he, like, you don't have to worry about bending it and having a big crease in the middle of it. Exactly. Right. 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 Roll it, it up. It's, Cause it's, it's like fabric, not like a stiff panel. It travels. Well, if you it need does. a travel pen, uh, this is the one. So that brings us uh, to our main topic, which is, as you mentioned earlier, the NFL's one shell rule. And we wanted to talk about this this week because we know and we have discussed that at least two NFL teams will be unveiling new uniforms in the near future, probably next month, uh, timed around the draft sometime in late April. Uh, and that is the Bengals, who will have a, a full new uniform set, and the Browns, who will have a new 75th anniversary throwback. Uh, and in both, both cases, there are questions about how those uniform unveilings could be affected by the potential repeal of the league's one shell rule. Uh, and there's been a lot of chatter about this. And for those who don't know, the rule was instituted in uh, 2013 and it was never really formally announced. It was, it was very strange. And I remember covering this at the time. I'm sure you do too, Chris. It, it, the season was getting started uh, the 2013 NFL season, and suddenly the Buccaneers just announced that their creamsicle throwbacks, the Bucko Bruce throwbacks, which they had planned to wear in the middle of that season, and which they had worn for a number of seasons in a row at that point, they would not be able to wear them, as it turned out, that year be because of this new rule that limited teams to one set of helmet shells. Uh, and so they, of course, they have the standard pewter shells, the Buccaneers do, and the Bucko Bruce uh, design is a white shell. And so they, there was really no way around that. They could have worn the cream school uniform with the pewter shell, but that didn't really look right. And, and there was just no way around it. And the league had made no announcement and the Buccaneers themselves seemed sort of caught off guard because they had planned to wear the throwback. And it turned out that uh, two safety advisory boards that advise the league on, on concussions and head safety and all those types of things had recommended that on balance, it was safer to try to limit players or to minimize the use of helmets for players 
to one major set of helmets, one primary set per year. And the idea was that helmets needed a breaking in period and just switching back and forth during the year was somehow unsafe. It was, it was never really fully explained. There was a lot, there were a lot of a lot of suspicion among fans that it had something to do with the league covering its butt regarding uh, concussion lawsuits. And things there was like a lot that. of lawsuits going on at the time. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, you know, for better or worse, for whatever reason, the rules stuck. And there were several, in addition to the, the creamsicles and the Buccaneers, uh, the Patriots with their Pat Patriot uh, throwback, that could no longer be worn because the Patriots normally have a silver shell, but the Pat Patriot shell is white. The Cowboys could no longer wear their white shell uh, Thanksgiving throwbacks, which they had worn for a number of years. And then there were some teams that were unaffected uh, and have been unaffected. Like if the Dolphins want to wear their throwbacks, they simply peel off their current logo decal and slap on the, the old throwback decal. And they can swap out their face mask too. The rule did not prevent teams from changing their helmet design. It just prevented them from using a different set of physical helmet shells. Uh, and I, like years after the rule, there's still a lot of confusion on that fact. I get questions every year from fans. Uh, but uh, so some teams, uh, the, the Dolphins, the Bears are another team. They just peel off their all their <laughs> logos and strike. Like they just go with a blank helmet, basically a blank Navy helmet. But it's the same physical helmet. Mm -hmm. uh, so some teams have been able to maintain uh, their throwback looks, but others haven't. And uh, another sort of, you can call it a, uh, a ben side benefit or a side restriction of this is that there have been no alternate helmets. Uh, and, and the reason this all plays into these upcoming unveilings by the Bengals and the Browns is that if the Browns really want to be period appropriate with this 75th anniversary throwback, they would go with white helmets because that's what the Browns wore in 1946. They were white leatherhead helmets, but uh, it, you know, if they wanted to really be period appropriate, they, they would need a new set of white shells. I think they could wear their current orange helmet and it would look fine with the throwback that is rumored and, and has been supposedly leaked. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if they want to be historically accurate, they need a white helmet. And the Bengals, of course, have that white color rush, the sort of white Bengal striping uh, rather than the orange. And you could see them wanting a white striped helmet, like a black and white helmet instead of a black and orange helmet to go with that as part of their new uniform set. And, and so again, we don't know if that's possible yet because we don't know if the rule is going to be repealed, but there's been a lot of chatter about it. And it was Buccaneers coach Bruce Arians who actually sort of hinted at that last spring when he said uh, on a radio show, I believe, he said, yeah, like next year we think, you know, when they lift the rule, when they lift the one helmet rule, we can bring back the creamsicle throwbacks. <laughs> but the league has never confirmed it. I've actually asked the league about it. And they've said, well, it's being discussed, but we don't know yet. Uh, and so uh, it's interesting to see how it's all going to play out. I do like that the Buccaneers have been responsible for just dropping this bomb on us both times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, it's sort of a full circle. I hadn't thought right. about that, but it's but it's true. And I, I think one of the interesting things about this is that some teams have wanted to lift the rule all along. Like in 2017, the Eagles actually proposed at an owner's meeting that the rule be lifted because uh, their owner, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, help me out here, Jeff Lurian, Lurian wanted, uh, he wanted to, he and a lot of the Eagles fans, they wanted to wear their Kelly green throwbacks and they can't wear the Kelly jerseys if they're going to wear the midnight green helmets. So they need different, a new set of Kelly green shells, uh, but they butt up against the rule. So they tried to get the rule overturned. And at that point, at least, uh, there wasn't enough ownership support for it. It was voted down. And, and so they, you know, the, and the rule has continued. I'm sort of amazed because, you know, you look at the NCAA and there are teams, there are schools that have, you know, two, three, four, five, six different helmets. It's, you know, it's, it's so different, the NFL versus the NCAA. And of course, there is no similar rule in the NCAA. And, and so there's no limitation on how many different helmet shells you can have. Now, I'm not an expert in NCAA, forgive me, but there is no union in the NCAA, right? No, I mean, obviously, that's, that's a big issue and, and issues of 
safety and, and player safety. I mean, that's been one of the criticisms of the NCAA for you know a long time is that they don't care that much about player safety and then they just exploit the players for free labor and extract value and blah blah blah. Uh, I, you know, I, I've talked to equipment managers. There are people on both sides of it, uh, but most equipment managers think it's okay. Um, to wear multiple helmet shells in, in a given season. Uh, you know, and it's, it's interesting also, I remember when I started writing about uniforms in the late 90s and into the early 2000s. And at that time, every college team had one helmet except Washington State. Washington State had one helmet designed for home and one on the road. And that was like wacko. Like, like, ooh, they're really out there with two different helmet designs, one for home games and one for the road. Now it's it's almost considered like expected yeah. that most most college teams are going to have, you know, two, three, four, four different helmets, different colors, a blackout helmet, a camouflage, like all these different designs. Uh, and it's kind of the wild west out there with the NCAA. And meanwhile, the NFL still has this one this one shell rule. Um, and if it's lifted, I think it's really interesting what's going to happen, not just with these throwbacks, which of course there'll, there'll be plenty of throwbacks, but what happens with alternate helmets? The, the NFL has been sort of famously conservative about team branding. You know, you're only allowed to wear an alternate uniform twice, and then they increased it to three times per season. Uh, and they've never allowed alternate helmets except for throwbacks, you know, but never like a like baseball teams have an alternate jersey or something like that. Nike and, has never been in charge with an alternate helmet option, Paul. That's uh, right, that. exactly. So. And I mean, when you when you look what has happened, how they've loosened the standards with color rush and things like that, imagine like if the cork came out of the bottle and you can suddenly have an unlimited number of helmets, imagine how Nike would run wild. And uh, I, I think it might be a, a case of be careful what you wish for, because I know so many fans want to see Bucko Bruce come back. They want to see Pat Patriot come back. They love the throwbacks, and I do too. But at what cost? But at what cost? Well, I, I really think it could be a flip side of the coin is that you could get those throwbacks, but you could get a lot of, of really bizarre alternate helmet designs as well. Uh, and I thought it would be fun if we went down the list. First, if, if the if the one shell rule were, list, were lifted, what throwbacks would you like to see come back in the NFL that are now not possible because of the one shell rule? Well, am I the only one that misses the Bills wearing red helmets? Because I feel like I am. You are the only one on this call who misses the Bills <laughs> wearing red. I hated the Bills in red. I love them in white. I really, I don't want them to bring back the red helmet. Consider uh, my but, age and when I grew up, right? Like, in the era I grew up and when the Bills oh. were dominating at least the AFC mm -hmm. and the Red Helmets and Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas and, and all those great teams. That's to me, that's what the Buffalo Bills look like. And I guess it's all perspective on when you grew up and when you fell. Sure. I, I grew up watching the Bill, you know, like the OJ Simpson era, the Joe right. Ferguson era where they had the white helmet. But also to me, red is like a trim color for the Bills. It's not a main color. And when you put the helmet in that color to me, it just it doesn't work for me. Uh, I like but, okay, but it. like I, I did ask you, what throwbacks yeah. would you like to see? So you want to see the Bills uh, with the red? Bills in the red, red, yeah. Red uh, Falcons in red would be good. And then, right, that seems like an obvious one to me. For sure. That's on my list as well. And uh, I think the, uh, what was it, the owner of the Titans? They teased a few years back saying, hey, we'd love to do a, an Oilers throwback, but we can't until they change that one helmet rule. Mm -hmm. so now we could sort of hold them to the fire to that and make them wear the... <laughs> the uh, Tennessee Oilers uh, helmet uh -huh. once again. Uh, that would be good. That, that oil Derek is missed, I think, in the NFL. Uh, I would like to see the Falcons in red, that sort of Steve Bartkowski era uniform to come back. Uh, I would like to see the Eagles uh, in, Ke I, I mean, frankly, I'd like to see the Eagles go back to Kelly full time, but if they can't do that, I'd at least like to see it as, as a throwback. Um, I would like to see the Titans, if they can't bring back the Oilers throwback, I'd like to see just the Titans white helmet as a throwback, you know, rather than their current Navy helmet. Um, I liked when the Steelers, there was a, a, there were a few years where they wore a yellow throwback yeah. helmet and I really liked that. And I'd like to see that again. Uh, of course, I'd love to see the Broncos in Royal, mm -hmm. uh, bringing back that, you know, the sort of orange crush era uh, throwback. 
And I would love to see the Rams be able to wear a white helmet um, uh, or a, a blue, a basic blue and white uh, throwback helmet. I guess can I'm. I guess they can do that now. I was thinking yep. that they needed a change of shell. All right. That, so, that was that okay. was their old uniform lad. They just need ago. to right. They just need to change the, the horn color. Okay. I was thinking out loud there, but that doesn't quite work. But, and and um, hold on, but let's let's point out, Paul, that uh this is uh not including the obvious ones, right? Like we we both want Bucko Bruce. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah. And yeah, and I want Pat Patriot. Patriot. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um now what about I think this is sort of where things could get a little kind of pushing the envelope a bit more. What do you think, not what would you like to happen, but mm -hmm. what do you think would happen if teams could suddenly have alternate helmets of any color? What What do you think we'd be seeing? Well, the color rush uniforms would look ridiculous. I think <laughs> that's, uh, that's a given. Uh, the team at the top of that list has got to be the Oregon Ducks of the NFL, the Seattle Seahawks. Mm -hmm. uh, they would they would go like electric lime green or something nuts on I, I agree. I think they would have a, a neon green helmet, an alternate helmet to wear with that that color rush uniform. Just yeah. go head to toe and let's, let's I mean, we're already in what it was in for a penny, in for a pound. Like let's just <laughs> jump right into the into this vat of toxic waste and come on out. Behold your Seattle Seahawks Nike Era alternate helmet. Uh -huh. uh, I think a, a less fun one, but a realistic one could be the LA Chargers uh, because they seem to already be playing around with the idea of alternate helmets to the extent that they can right now. Uh, mm -hmm. They wear different logos for their home, their road, and their two different alternate jerseys, right? Like they keep swapping out the colors of the numbers and the lightning bolts. I could see them perhaps just with their uh, Navy alternate uniform going with a navy blue helmet uh which i have on display behind me here from the, uh, <laughs> the doug flutie years with the chargers as well well that could be um, a throwback right like they could bring that back as a throwback i guess that would be a throwback i didn't even think about it um and uh how about the jacksonville jaguars going with a teal shell since they're embracing oh, teal. you know i hadn't thought about that but it's as long as they don't bring back the two-tone shell but the teal, that, that's yeah. really interesting idea i had not thought about the teal how about shell. a teal the gold gradient shell no i'm sorry <laughs> i said it don't take my advice. Uh, a teal, no, a teal shell for the jet. That's an inspired idea. That would so work. I think I, I was going through like the list of teams. First, I think we would see a ton of black helmets. Like I think a bunch of teams would have black alternate helmets, beginning with the Saints, who of course briefly wore a black helmet in the 1969 preseason, never in the regular season. Uh, but we know what that looks like because their uniforms haven't really changed that much, but they, they did wear the, that black helmet. Uh, and then we're told, no, you didn't like, get that approved by, by the league uh, and they couldn't wear it in the regular season. Uh, but the photos are out there and we know what that looks like. And honestly, it doesn't look that bad. Looks good. Uh, I think there's a strong chance that the Raiders would go with a black helmet, a black alternate helmet. And um, you can imagine their fans, like that, that whole that crazy pit of fans they have with a black helmet to cheer for. Uh, I think the Eagles, like all the teams that now have black alternate jerseys, but yeah. don't have black helmets to match. So the Eagles, the Jets, the Cardinals, I could see all of those teams going to black alternate helmets. I could also imagine the Cardinals with a red alternate helmet because they are Cardinals after all. Like, yes. I, you know, I, I, I could see that happening. Um, I could see the Bengals with uh, a white alternate shell with like, like we just described, and that could be part of the new uniform set that's coming. And I could imagine the Packers with some sort of metallic gold or even green. And I'm not saying all these things are good ideas. I'm yeah. not saying I want to see them all, but I can imagine that happening in a league where suddenly anything goes and where Nike is, is basically <laughs> calling with PowerPoint presentations and say, let me walk you through how your team could look one or two times a year. And, and, I, I, I think a fair number of the things I just described could definitely could happen. Uh, Arizona, happen. Arizona Cardinals in black is terrifying. I think that would be yeah. horrible. <laughs> in, in red, though, that would look, I think that would look pretty good. I think that could look really good. Yeah. Um, the Packers, they they almost went to metallic gold back in the 90s. I, I That is true. Around 93, 94, they were planning to do it, and then they sort of backed off. Yeah. What about your 49ers going silver? Well, that would be a throwback. Yeah, you know, because they they actually wore silver helmets in the fifties and sixties. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see that as a throwback, but it, they are so associated with gold that mm -hmm. I 
and and silver seems like a not to me so much because I really like silver, but I think for a lot of people, silver seems like a step down, mm-hmm. like it's a downgrade. Like you don't go from like the top top shelf to middle shelf kind of thing. <laughs> and going from gold to silver, I think, would be perceived by many people as a, a downgrade. I think as a throwback with that leaked. They're calling it the 94. Well, we're calling it the 94 throwback jersey, but could it just as easily be a 50s throwback which, when they actually right. wore the silver helmets? So, right. Yeah, that, that could be interesting. That could For work. Sure. You can see that work. Um, I think uh, back in the uh, one shell days, I would have liked to have seen a few more teams just trying it out by by putting the old logo on the modern shell. Like, mm-hmm. just, just try it. Like the Broncos did it. And it looked it looked okay. Right. So you're talking about the Broncos color rush design where they took their old D with the snorting Bronco uh, and they put it on their their current Navy shell rather than the old Royal shell that they used to wear that logo with. And And it did look good. You're right. It looked good. So they they still were able to do the throwback. They still uh, kept within the rules and it sort of created a... Uh, an opportunity to see a modernized version of a throwback design. Uh, we saw this in the during the NFL 75th season when mm-hmm. uh, the Bills and the Jets, they both wore, uh, Bills had the white standing buffalo on the red helmet. The Jets had the, the old 60s logo, but on a green helmet. On a green helmet, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, thought and I think in those cases, were pro- it was probably more laziness. Yes. But, I, but you're <laughs> suggesting this is a way to sort of expand the brand. Yeah. Uh, and the parameters uh, this, of the brand. This uh, point might be moot now with the approval of second helmets. But if they're not allowed, um, why not put Patriot Pat on a silver helmet? Let's just see what he looks like. And I think right. it might look good. Yeah, you can darken the colors to match the uniforms. And it's a way to throw back while uh, also uh, going by the rule book and uh, mm-hmm. following the NFL's no fun playbook. Well, this is sort of like what the NHL has done. It's not quite the same thing, but it, reverse retro is sort of in that same spirit that it takes colors and kind of fl- color swaps them. And it, and it says that you don't have to do it exactly the way you did it before. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can take an old logo or a Jersey crest in the case of the NHL and, and put it against a different background and it's still related to your, your overall color scheme but it may not be exactly what you wore before. And, and so I, I, that seems to be sort of in keeping with what you're saying. And, yeah, and, and I, can, I, I can see like not just the NFL, I can see a lot of leaks going in that direction. And here, let me uh, translate to NFL and Nike. More jerseys, more money you can sell. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There, there. They love the idea now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that hadn't occurred to them until you said that. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Oh, so uh, leaving aside the safety issue and only talking about the aesthetics of this, on balance, has the one shell rule been bad for the NFL because it's eliminated some of these much loved throwbacks? Or would you say it's been good because it's presented, prevented teams from Nike from being Nike and sort of just rein them in? And I, I think it's they could do. a tough call to say whether it's on balance been a good thing. I mean, we're going to find out if they lift it. And- I think another way to say, to ask that question is on balance, if they lift the rule, is that going to be like something we're really happy about? Or are we going to, are we going to be thinking, oh my God, what have they done? Because I, I do think there are going to be some designs out there that are just bonkers. And, and we may see, we'll see if they limit teams to just one alternate helmet or, you know, could they have three or four, like, you know, like in the, the NCAA, I think it's a tough call. I, I, uh, because I fear what Nike is capable of uh, and what teams are, are the roads that teams are, are willing to go down, I am, I, I think on balance, it has probably reined in some of the worst potential excesses mm-hmm. that we could have seen and kept the NFL looking basically like the NFL, uh, especially in the color rush era, which could, which is already sort of, you know, to my mind, doesn't look that much like the NFL or what I think of as the NFL, but it could have looked even wackier and more bonkers uh, if they could have had the the neon green helmet to go with the neon green uh, uniform or whatever, mm-hmm. other examples like that. Uh, so I, I do think it's sort of a, a case of be careful what you wish for. And so, uh, you know, if they, obviously we don't control what they do with the rule. If they do lift the rule, I'll be happy to have those throwbacks back. I'll enjoy the good 
but I, I am a little scared of the potential bad. Yeah, I think if if the day ever comes when they announce it, and to be honest, I don't think they'll ever announce it. I think it'll be, there's a new uniform unveiling and oh, they have an alternate shell color. And I think that's how we'll find out. I can't see- Oh, that's interesting. You, you don't think they'll actually do it with any, see, I disagree. I think Nike will, there'll be some sort of, an out, like saying like, now we are, you know, the, the restrictive, Bound, the restrictive ties that bound us for all these years are fun. we're finally free of all that and oh wait till you see what we're going to be able to do i think right. with the with the the sensitivity around the the concussion and all that stuff i i no, feel that, they're going to be that's possible yeah. I'll, I'll tell you over the years there have been uh, there's been no shortage of fans who who have like blatantly told me or just been like you can say honest enough or, or just however you want to frame it but who have said yeah i don't really care about the safety issue i just want to see the cool throwbacks like i really don't you know if the, you know there and a lot of fans do believe that it's it's a it's a dangerous game it's a, a brain damaging game and there's no safe way to play it and the players know that and we all know it and just stop pretending otherwise and just at least make it look good and I guess that's sort of a cynical approach. Uh, I, I can't say it's quite how I think about it, but uh, but there's certainly, uh, I, I know from personal experience, there's a fair number of people out there who, who think that way. Uh, well, the CFL managed to do it for about five or six years uh, with home and road, you know, home and road helmets, um, five and six years after the NFL implemented their uh, policy. But then in 2019, they just, they followed the NFL. So there might be some... Yeah, that's, that's yeah. interesting. For years, people were saying that the NCAA has no rule like this. High schools don't have rules like this. CFL doesn't have a rule like this. But the CFL does now have a rule like this. It took them a little longer. Like you said, it was not until 2019 that they instituted their own uh, one-shell rule. But um, yeah, so the NFL is not alone in that regard. Well, going back to uh, whether this was a on balance, whether this was good or bad to have one helmet. Um, I'm going to have to say, ultimately, I think it was good uh, really? from, an, from an aesthetic point of view. Because you think it, it sort of kept things at least within certain boundaries and guidelines? Yes. And because when Nike first took over, things got a little nutty, right? Like, look what the Cleveland Browns did. Look what the Buccaneers did uh, to their uniforms, the Jaguars as well. Can you imagine you know, what they would have done uh, to the helmets, if they were able to, to the Browns, to the Jaguars, to the Buccaneers, uh, to Color Rush. Uh, and now Nike has sort of learned. They've had to roll back the Jaguars. They had to roll back the Bucks. They had to roll back the Browns. And hopefully they have learned their lesson and seen that going too far is a problem. And the teams in the league realize that going too far is a problem. Uh, maybe in 2015, it would have been uh, really, really bad. But maybe now here, six years later in 2021, um, they realize that this is a problem and we can't do this, uh, you know, for all teams, except for Seattle, of course. <laughs> so, so you think that even whether the original thinking behind the rule was safety based or yes. whatever it might've been, or, you know, legalistic or, or whatever, that it, it intentionally or not, it provided some aesthetic guardrails that kind of kept things at least somewhat within a reasonable range of design choices. Yeah, it, it allowed me to actually watch an NFL game and not quickly turn the channel. <laughs> that's, a, that's a better way to put it, Chris, yeah. But, you know, losing throwbacks, that's bad. But reigning in Nike during their craziest period ever, probably a good thing. And like I said, six years later, seven years later, um, it'll be a little nicer, I hope. I hope I can still see some crazy stuff in there, but I think overall it'll be good. Well, we'll get, uh, we, we don't know how this is going to play out, but hopefully in about a month in late April, uh, we expect to see those Bengals and Browns unveilings and we'll see how they play it. And of course, even if they don't have alternate or throwback helmets for those designs, the we could still change the rule sometime between the spring and the start of next season. So it, these unveilings are not necessarily the last word, but they're at least going to be the the next sort of signpost in the, this this saga, I guess. And uh, and there's been, I mean, there's been so much chatter about it. I I see tweets and I get emails 
um, just about every week, uh, ever since Bruce Arians said that thing on the radio last year, people are, a lot of fans are really eager to see more experimentation, more throwbacks and so on. So uh, uh, we'll see, we'll see how it comes out. I think it's gonna happen. I, you know, you've seen this before, you've seen when news sort of trickles out, this has the same feeling that, you know, little hints have accidentally been dropped, little mm -hmm. teasers and, uh, this has that same vein of uh, uh, feeling. I, I think we're going to get them. And uh, like I said, I don't think it's going to be a big announcement. We'll just see the Bengals come out one day or the uh, Browns come out. And, oh, look, there's a, a white helmet. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. that'll kick off the second helmet revolution in the NFL. Uh -huh. that's, a, that's a really interesting prediction of, that, that, uh, of how they'll handle it. So we're not, we're not only waiting to see what happens, but how it happens. And, and yeah. so that's really, that's, that's well, as, point. As people who cover this for a living, you know, you, you can sort of start to predict how, <laughs> how it's going to come <laughs> For out. sure, for sure. Not our first rodeo. <laughs> All right, uh, now it's time for another word from another sponsor. This episode of Unified is brought to you in part by Homefield Apparel. Are you bored with all the cookie cutter t-shirts for your favorite college sports teams? Homefield Apparel, a premier brand out of Indianapolis, offers incredibly comfortable, officially licensed apparel with vintage college sports design, so you won't look like everyone else wearing the same Nike t-shirt. Homefield combs through historic collections to find unique logos, mascots, and other graphics, and then uses those graphics to make thoughtful designs for schools as large as the University of Alabama and as small as a Division III school at Hope College. Check them out at homefieldapparel.com and get 15% off your first order with the checkout code UNIFIED. That's homefieldapparel.com and use the checkout code UNIFIED for 15% off. And I can honestly say that the uh, t-shirts the and the sweatshirt, a hoodie that Homefield Apparel sent me, are literally the softest garments I own. They like they use the, like some kind of really nice fabric blend and a, a nice wash uh, for it, and it, it's just it's really plush. And I know you got a package from them as well, and uh, I, I imagine you found the same thing. I did, yeah. They gave me a, a Syracuse orange hoodie, which is great timing. Hopefully, they're still in the tournament by the time this airs. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I find like I've worn it two, three days in a row. It's not dirty, but it's that comfortable. It's uh, really like it really it is. is. And we're not yeah. just like seriously, folks, we're not just saying this. Like it's a seriously like the t-shirt I'm wearing right now is nice, but the home field apparel t-shirts are really nice. Like seriously, a very nice t-shirt. So the old, the old navy people aren't gonna like that endorsement. <laughs> well, they don't advertise with us. <laughs> but but go check them out and uh, check out home field apparel. Uh, you you won't be sorry. Absolutely. It's got Paul and Chris's guarantee. <laughs> uh question of the week. Question of the week. We have a listener submitted question every week. And who is our listener and what is their question this week? Our listener this week is Jacob King, who asks, what is your opinion of teams with non-animal mascots? Examples would include Miami Heat, Chicago Sky, Seattle Storm, and the Minnesota Wild. Well, that, that's an odd question, the way he, the, the examples he chose, because a lot of my favorite teams, like the Mets and the 49ers are not animals, yeah. but at least they end in S. Mm -hmm. All the team names he chose do not end in S. They're like collective, like the sky and the heat, they're collective nouns. And for a, I, I wonder if that's what he really meant, the like teams with that kind of name. I think uh, so. For a long time, I used to say uh, I was unalterably opposed to any team name that didn't end in S except White Sox and Red Sox. Yes. <laughs> which are sort of spiritually they end in S. Right. You know? uh, but, you know, sports has changed. And this is a change I, 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 I'm a little surprised to hear myself saying. I don't mind that much. I think there are a lot of good team names out there. Uh, I like the Minnesota Wild. Maybe, maybe I like it because I've liked a lot of their uniforms over the years. Uh, I'm okay with the Miami Heat. I'm okay with the Orlando Magic. These are team names that in years past I would have thought were just ridiculous. And... I, it, I guess it's part of it is that I've gotten used to it. The biggest problem I find is that people aren't consistent with whether to refer to them as singular or plural. Yes. Like the Heat have a new player or the Heat has a new player. <laughs> and I always say plural. I use plural for any, whether it's Mets or Heat or whatever. I, I use it as a plural. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with team names like that. And, but I remember thinking, oh, there's going to be some team called the Extreme 
and I'm just going to hate it, you know, like the, the Los Angeles extreme. And maybe there has been in some, has there been a team called like in the XFL? In, in the or? XFL, it was the Los Angeles extreme. Oh, there really was. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. That must be that they planted the seed in my head. But aside from that, as long as none of the major, like the major level pro leagues have some ridiculous name like that, uh, where it just sounds like it, it's designed to get, you know, adolescent boys pumping their fists in, in some <laughs> moronic way. Uh, then, I, yeah, I, I think a lot of these names are fine. Uh, what do you think? I think uh, a team without an S at the end of the name makes it really tough to write an article. And I think you alluded to that in your, <laughs> and really that's, that's what I'm concerned about right now as someone who writes articles every day. You can, uh, you can always just say Miami, you know, yeah, like Miami has a true. Record. That's true. Well, there's also the uh, the Lightning. How about the Utah Jazz? They've been around right. for 40 right. years. I mean, that's the thing. Like a lot, some of these names go back a ways, right? Yeah. The Utah Jazz, for sure. Uh, I like it because it, it shakes things up, right? Things would get a little bit repetitive if, well, my, my answer has more to do with non-animals, but uh, if it was always animal versus animal, or how about, let's just say plural versus plural, <laughs> it would get a little repetitive after a while. Uh, you brought up the extreme and that almost happened in the NHL, which we talk about in my book with Todd Radom, The Fabric of the Game. Oh, that, that was one of the names that was being tossed around for the Nordiques movie, yeah. right? They were, they were going to be called the Rocky Mountain Extreme. Fortunately, a brave, brave hero at the Denver Post leaked out that name. <laughs> and thank you, fans of Denver. Thank you so much for putting a stop to that. Because if they were called the Rocky Mountain Extreme, that name would have been engraved on the Stanley Cup in 1996 and <laughs> i have a feeling they would have had the uh, the better judgment to change it before they won again in 2001 but that would have been stuck on there forever now did did this denver post writer did he leak it in a, in an attempt to get it stopped that's a very good question um i think journalistic integrity probably no mm -hmm. uh, i think he just had information and shared it with his readers as well, he wasn't journalist. saying like this is ridiculous this needs to be i know. don't believe so i'll have to go back and relook at the article but it just but had I, that effect sort of like the, the 49ers famous uh right. temporary helmet design and yes yes yeah but thanks so much for that but on uh, on the whole uh, i don't mind singular names as long as they're not ridiculous names to be honest I think a name like the uh, Rumble Ponies or the Rubber Ducks is far more obnoxious uh, <laughs> than, than the Sky or the Wild or the Lightning uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, or the Kraken. Well, there, there goes your chance to, uh, to work for minor league baseball, Chris. Uh, minor league baseball, I like you as an organization. Uh, work on your names a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chris, I believe we have once again lurched our way to the end of an episode. Lurched. We solved another uniform uh, issue, I guess. Did we is solve it? I don't, I don't know if we solved it. Well, I think the NFL is going to have to solve it, and we're just going to get to watch. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's free consultation fees. We don't, have to, we don't charge them for this. <laughs> and that means it's time for me to say that Unified is a joint production of UniWatch and SportsLogos.net. Our producer editor is Chris Fraterigo. Show notes for this episode are available at our website, unified.show. You can follow us on Twitter at, at UnifiedCast, where you can also learn about the t-shirts and stickers we have for sale. The Unified logo is by Brian Gundell. Our theme music is by Chuck Rios. If you're listening to us on audio, you can also see video versions of our episodes at youtube.com slash sports logos. The animation at the start of our videos is by Michael Princip. To submit a question for our question of the week segment or to inquire about advertising or anything else, email us at info at unified.show. If you like our show, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And that's it for this episode. We'll see you next week. We expect to have Ross Yoshida from the Los Angeles Dodgers. He's their design director. He'll be our, our guest for that episode and the first guest ever on Unified. Uh, the first of many, we hope. Until then, stay well, stay unified, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.